Well, definitely welcome um, and, and uh, welcome everybody else who I see quite a few folks signing on right now. Um, thanks for joining us at our uh, quarterly NDSA infrastructure interest group meeting. And um, in terms of uh, our agenda, I think uh, I'll go ahead and paste uh, the link to the running notes one more time for folks who haven't seen it. And we have, uh, yeah, we're planning on dedicating the first uh, part of the meeting to uh, uh, having Leslie uh, talk with us about distributed cloud storage. Uh, Leslie Johnson is here from, uh, from NARA to talk with us about that. And we're definitely looking forward to kind of hearing from other folks about their experiences and um, kind of joining in on that conversation. And Robin, Robin, I see you're signed on as well. Hey, Robin. Hi there, Leslie. Welcome. Thanks. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Nice to see everybody. Yeah, I know. It's, it feels like it's been a while. It has been. And we also delayed our meeting for, uh, for Juneteenth, which uh, hopefully everybody had a, a good holiday and everything. And um, let's see. If everybody could take a minute to add their name to the attendance list, that would be great. Um, I think, I'm not sure. Is there anybody new who's joining us for our first interest group meeting here? I think I see a lot of folks who I recognize. Okay. Yes, I might be considered a new hi my name is uh sean reichardt i'm a uh records consultant with the uh washington state archives in olympia and i uh one of the projects we've been working on is we're looking to um uh maybe start working with archive it for the purposes of archiving state and local government websites and i was just your your organization came up as a um, uh, hub for like web archiving resources so i was just curious to see uh what these meetings look like and so forth. Great. All right. Well, yeah, welcome. Um, there is, uh, did you have the link to the running notes document? Did you see that uh, or did you just join? Uh, I just joined. I, I have the, the minutes pulled up in the Google Doc. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let me, I'll go ahead and um, note you under the new members book. Area. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So, okay, with regard to just our agenda, uh, as I mentioned, Leslie will be talking uh, initially, and then we are going to take a little time after that um, to chat about a uh, a charter actually that um, Preservica has approached NDSA with um, that has to do with different sustainability principles uh, related to digital preservation. So um, that will be kind of like the latter, latter part of the meeting. And uh, not I did see quite a few people kind of jump into that document, look at it. So look forward to that conversation as well. But um, with that, yeah, Leslie, um, take it away. That'd be great. Sure. I do have some slides to keep myself you now sort of on track. All right, can you see the slides? Uh, yes. Great. Totally great. All right. So um, I'm Leslie Johnston. I'm the Director of Digital Preservation at the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA. You all know Elizabeth. Elizabeth is part of my team. Um, I used to be really involved in the NDSA and the infrastructure group, but uh, life and work have gotten kind of busy, and I'm sorry I haven't been very um, available to participate, but I was glad to get the uh, invitation for today. So I always start with a little bit about the National Archives, so the uh, sort of understand our scope. Um, 
we encompass a huge set of operations for the entire government, for the entire US government, for scheduling, transferring, reviewing, processing, storing, preserving, and providing access to electronic records and, of course, still, still physical records from the US government agencies, that's federal and presidential, and to a limited extent, congressional. Um, so we have multiple systems that have to handle this. So there we go. There's kitten number one. <laughs> Hello, this is, this is, she just came to us with the name sour cream. And the other one is applesauce. In other words, latka toppings. But all right, you're going back to your chair. There you go. Go be um, cute over there. <laughs> Nice to meet them. Um, so uh, I think somebody just mentioned that we're seeing your presenter view in the All slide. All right, let me I turn off. And that was. Hi, presenter view. Oh, yeah. Michelle, thanks, Michelle. All right, is that good? I turned off the presenter view. Okay, now we're, now we're seeing the usual PowerPoint layout. Okay. Um, interesting. Yeah, because I certainly see the entire thing. Let okay. me let me un let me stop share and reshare because life is never easy. Ever. All right, how's that? Uh, let's see. That's coming across. Okay, there you go. Yeah, that right. looks good. Thank All right, you. thanks. All right, so because we have different types of records, we have different systems. Um, we have classified and unclassified. We have federal present presidential legislative systems. They all have their own regulatory management and access controls. And ERA 2.0, which came into production in 2018, is our cloud-based electronic processing environment and preservation repository. So, why are you not moving? You know, it's always something. You know, how about if I just, there we go. All right, so we use AWS. Um, we do our development in AWS and our repository in AWS. Um, we don't use commodity Amazon. We use the Amazon Glove, GovCloud which means that it's the version of um, AWS and S3 that has gone through a particular security review for the US federal government to use. Um, we originally started our work in commodity Amazon, but it's really a lot easier for us to do the work in GovCloud because that way the security controls are already inherited and we don't need to worry about certain things about how we have to get this you know, approved for operation and use. Um, this does mean that there are certain aspects of using Amazon that we had to make some changes to. And I'll show you a diagram because we can't send the records themselves back and forth out to the commodity hosted Amazon services. We have to stick build them ourselves and run them in our own security enclave. So we can't say use what used to be called Elasticsearch, you know, on the Amazon hosted side, we have to stick build our own and keep it in our secure enclave, even in GovCloud. So we have two functional areas for this. We have ingest or transfer into sort of a processing area, which is where the archivists work in virtual machines. And the final ingest into our preservation repository which is not a move or a copy. Um, it's actually applying different logical controls with extensive event log uh, logging. We are currently, um, one of the reasons we did this um, is that you know we were on-prem like everybody else for a very, very long time with an earlier version of this system that we refer to as ERA base, um, but also our ERA EOP, Executive Office of the President, um, ERA census or title 13 um, and um, congressional. 
And we did all, we ran all of these in on-prem server environments and federal contracting has a long lead time, which means it's very difficult for us to make any sort of agile changes in the work. When we started the work on ERA 2.0, we already knew that we wanted to do this in the cloud because we were actually gonna be working in an agile development mode and our sprints were four weeks long. And there was no way that we could actually run four week agile sprints in an on-prem environment that is primarily contracted, although so is this. Um, so we couldn't do that sort of agile work and incremental improvement in an on-prem server as easily as we could in a cloud environment. So GovCloud, for Amazon is currently, um, we are currently only within one zone. So we are currently in the East zone, which does give us replication within the entirety of the East. Um, this is not what we want. Um, we would actually, and so we're already planning two things. We're planning adding West Coast replication so we have both east-west replication. So we're replicated within the east and west zones and between them. Um, this actually did come up for us as an issue um, briefly um, last year when there was a major cut to um, an east coast fiber channel. And we are replicated across the east, but not in the west. And therefore, we had a brief period of time when we could not actually access the records in the system because we didn't have that national replication. So this has become a priority for us. Um, we're also looking to do what the Library of Congress has been doing and actually have a copy stored with a different cloud provider. Now, being the federal government, this all has to be contracted and it's a lengthy process. So I don't yet know um, where and when we're going to be storing it in a different environment and when that will actually happen for us. So this messy and very slightly old um, model, um, since it still says obviously Elasticsearch on there and it's no longer called Elasticsearch, but this gives you a sense of the architecture that um, we have in place. Um, it's entirely, you know, obviously web services, web app. Um, we are working with Docker and Docker swarms. Um, we have a lot of uh, sense of agents. You know, we, um, we use Lambda functions a lot in this, um, our own built Lambda functions. Um, we do have a database at one point, our architecture, um, we considered doing a, uh, a data lake. We are doing a data warehouse with Postgres um, in terms of disaster recovery that sort of makes that perhaps slightly easier for us. Um, we have, I'll talk a little bit about the ways that we work in this environment, um, but we need to have uh, two different Elasticsearch clusters uh, for a processing side and the discovery side. And um, we obviously keep everything in S3 buckets. We have in the last year or so moved to tiered buckets. So we have some, you know, most of it is in a standard S3 bucket, but we now have things in Glacier. Um, we do have content that is embargoed. Uh, such as census records, but also the records we get from congressional committees and commissions, and those go into Glacier. Um, we are required for our congressional records to be able to bring things back within a 24 hour period. So that works for us having the tiered Glacier storage. Um, as I said before, um, the current setup um, has basically two areas of operation. One is processing the DPE, the digital processing environment, and the other is DOR, the digital object repository. So on the processing side, um, records are transferred to us by agencies. Um, we bring them in to that processing environment. Uh, and we have three different, you know, sort of modes of working with those files. We do have a metadata import. Um, in previous years, we 
we're not requiring agencies to give us much metadata. This wasn't something in our regulations. Um, we would get some very basic metadata about the record series. So what sort of general area and type of records they were and how they went together intellectually. Obviously knew which federal agency or component that we got the records from and some other information. So we do require that and it does come along in um, some form that we can then bring into the system and then, then do some bulk editing and some creation. This regulation is changing soon, and we are going to be doing much more extensive metadata work with these records because we're going to be requiring much more extensive metadata as we are switching from the hybrid of getting both paper and electronic records to with the memorandum M1921 receiving only electronic records. Um, obviously, agencies still have PEPRA records that are scheduled, and they will be coming to us, but over time, we'll be gradually winding down the transfer of paper records, except there will always be some exceptions, you know, treaties that have been signed, uh, certain, you know, um, certain other materials that have wet signatures, um, which we will always receive, um, obviously, gifts that come into the presidential administrations, you know, if somebody gets, you know, a teddy bear, that teddy bear is actually a federal record, someone gives that to the president, it comes to us and then to the presidential library. Um, we have our command line or embedded tools that are batch work, such as tools for unzipping, you know, zipped container files to list files in a transfer, identify MIME types or formats, and apply and check fixities. The bulk of the work is really done in workbench, what we call our workbenches, which are VMs. So part of the key to this architecture was if you're going to be working in the cloud, if the agencies are gonna be transferring it from the cloud and the files are gonna live in the cloud, why should we actually introduce any additional risk by copying them down out of the cloud into some local environment to do work and then copying back up because those are additional steps that are always you know, a potential for risk when something is moving and being copied. So the way this works is that the archivists identify a set of records, a transfer and accession group that has come into the processing environment. They bring that into a VM, they do the work in the VM, and then the finalized processed files are then brought back out as new versions and then the final ingest process happens um, when all the logical controls are put in place for the repository. Um, any of the events that we logged during processing are brought into the log for the preservation repository, and they are indexed for staff discovery. So this is something that came up when we were doing our 16363 self-assessment, um, is that our um, user group for this, our designated community is staff. This is not a public catalog. This is a not a publicly accessible system. So our designated community is staffed and staff only. So processing and reference archivists and preservation archivists. And so they're indexed for use by the staff. And um, we do have APIs to get things out to the group that processes them for the catalog. So um, we're currently doing the work to wind down the way we used to do object and record scheduling. So business object management and scheduling. So creating those disposition schedules for the agencies. And we have brought, we're bringing them into 2.0 from ERA base. Uh, so all of this work will also be happening in the cloud. Um, that means that there will be over 200 agencies that will be working directly in the cloud environment to um, suggest and for the review and the approval and then use of schedules sometime in 2022. Cloud to cloud is a big thing for us because of course, you know, most agencies have their records in the cloud, if you think about it. Um, they might be using uh, Microsoft 365 they might be using SharePoint for records management. 
They could be a Google for government agency, like we are at the archives. So the records, or they might be hosted in systems, created and hosted in systems that are already in the cloud, but hosted by vendors. So pretty much everything is actually in the cloud, less and less is local on hard drives and machines and servers. So it's key for us to have this cloud to cloud transferability where um, an agency can get their material, their records into an S3 bucket um, that we have identified, and then it can be transferred from their S3 bucket into our S3 ingest bucket, where the, we can then launch the processes to do the ingest into the repository. So we're starting off with Amazon GovCloud because you know the agencies that are using Amazon and AWS and S3 are primarily working in GovCloud environments, and so are many of the hosted environments, but not all that the federal contractors use. We have a lot of agencies asking for Azure because Office 365 and SharePoint are huge in the government. So that will be next for us. We started with a large internal test for the 1950 census. Um, these were files that were um, digitized uh, in some cases by a partnership and in some cases in-house, and they needed to be transferred from um, actually two different S3 buckets into the repository. So that was our first internal test, and that was completed prior to the release of the 1950 census on the beginning of April. And those things not only had to be ingested in the repository, they actually had to be moved out so they could be um, delivered by our um, public-facing systems. We have also just finished our first large scale external test with an agency. Um, we actually also worked with the Census Bureau on this because the census had a really timely need where they wanted to immediately transfer the 2020 census files to us for us to manage for the 72 year embargo period. So we now have done proof of concept for both large internal cloud to cloud transfers and cloud to cloud transfer from an agency to NARA. Um, because we're a federal agency, there's a process to getting this approved for production operations. So I can't tell you when we'll scale this up and go live for production for a larger number of agencies, but we're really happy with the proof of concepts that we've actually done so that we can actually do these cloud to cloud transfers. Um, some of the other things that we've had going on, um, our EOP, Executive Office of the President uh, collections, um, each of which represents a single presidential administration, and we have those going back to the Reagan administration. We have recently migrated those from an on-prem server environment into a cloud environment. We haven't yet brought them into ERA 2.0. There's a lot of functionality that those systems need that we haven't yet brought into ERA 2.0, but we did, were able to successfully work with the White House to say, yes, this material can go in the cloud. This, as we just saw with our test with the Census Bureau, Census is also on board with this, with bringing the Census Title 13 um, records directly into the cloud. So we now have both White House and Census records in distributed stored cloud environments. Um, but because we are an extremely physically distributed agency, we have over 40 facilities across the US, both federal record centers and the um, presidential libraries. We um, need to actually work still with physical storage. So we have put into place a workflow where we have snowballs, um, as well as distributed direct connect connections to Amazon. So that if we have a really, really, really large transfer, um, say like one from the Coast Guard um, for the um, Deepwater Horizon transfer or transfers we look at with NARA, um, with NARA, with NASA, um, we can make snowballs available so that they can be then loaded directly at an Amazon secure operating center. 
um, as the government, we had to just put in PIV authentication so that it could be actually managed by a government um, auth authentication and authorization system. And we're always in the process of putting in new embedded tools um, in as well as tools for our VMs. And as Elizabeth can tell you, we have the never ending struggle with documentation, keeping documentation of our processes up to date as we update those processes. All right, sweetie, down you go. Oop. Um, that's really all I wanted to say to sort of start off the discussion is just give you that overview and I'm happy to answer any questions and if I can't answer them, I will happily pass them on to our director of system engineering and get answers for you. So let me stop sharing. And there we are. Hey, well, thank you, Leslie. Appreciate it. Um, really, really interesting uh, um, elements going on there and many things to talk about. Um, I have a, a bunch of questions, but I want to definitely open it up uh, to everyone else, see what folks think. Feel free to put anything in the chat or uh, just unmute and ask away. I see some familiar colleagues in the audience. I'm sure at least one of them has a question. No, I either under-described or over-described what we did. I knew John would be the one to jump up. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, Leslie. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm realizing I'm looking kind of orange. Um, um, but uh, my uh, my question was um, more um, actually this may be inappropriate. It's like a political. Are you getting political requests to, and you have to defend? Yeah, there's the political side of archives. Uh, you can say that's off topic today, but I'm thinking it's um, you know there's so much depends on evidence and who said what when. How is, is that, are you in the hot seat for that? Or do you have lawyers? And... Oh, we've got lawyers. <laughs> we have lawyers. No, and you know, you're, you're not wrong that it's a, a constant live issue for an organization like ours, especially because in particular, we hold the presidential materials. So um, we, whenever a presidential transfer of records happens, even though there can't be, they aren't open to the public for five years, they're not available for FOIA for five years. They are immediately available to um, the former administration, the current administration, the Department of Justice, you know, for any sort of work that's needed. Hold on. He's in the other room. Sorry, we're taking the other cat to the vet today. Yeah, they're here. So we need to, you know, we need to be responsive to that. So one of the reasons that we haven't brought the EOP systems in yet to ERA 2.0 is because of the way that we need to handle uh, requests for those records. Um, I mean, really, we are a trusted agency. And because we do such extensive event logging, um, we have never been asked to say, prove it, prove that this is the authentic record in that way. But if we were to be asked, we could provide a log of every single activity from when it came into our custody to our delivering it to them. So we could. Okay. And on a slightly more technical level, um, you know, since the beginning of digital preservation, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, digests and checksums and so forth. And these algorithms have changed quite a bit. Um, you you mentioned you're not you've not been asked to prove authenticity, but have you um, discovered? Do you have any wisdom on the whole concept of? You know, verifying checksums, uh, is it overdone? Has it, did you underestimate or whatever? 
I honestly think it's overdone. If we were to attempt to, we have 2.1 billion files in our repository. If we were to try to do running audits of every single checksum for every file in our holdings, we would never not be running checksums. It's impossible. So we have a, um, in, the, in the dawn of time when we introduced our work with tapes to store things as backups, we actually put in place a local practice of 10% sampling. And so that is the guideline that we continue to consider our operating guideline is that if we can do 10% sampling, um, we're actually pretty pleased with that. I mean, one of the nice things, I mean, it's like amp, the good and bad of, of Amazon is that and we know that Amazon is under the scenes doing their own check summing and checking, but it's a completely black box. We can't see their check summing or see the results of their fixity checking, um, but we can see ours. And so, you know, my real wisdom is that don't trust just Amazon, you know, right. period. You know, it would be like relying on, you know, just Amazon, which we have for a while and we, we're now getting to, to move on. But, you know, if I was just using their black box checking I, that I couldn't prove to someone, then that's not appropriate stewardship for a federal agency. Okay, thank you. I kind of um, just thinking on a on a much smaller scale, uh, you know, with with the repository we have at CDL, um, where we have around you know fifty million objects or something like that, and you know increasing, but you know increasingly our fixed D service, you know, the compute power behind it has to be scaled, and then the database credits have to be scaled, so we don't run out of you know database credits while the fixed D checking is taking place, and that has to be kind of tuned in a way over the course of time. So um, I can only imagine what that means at a, a much, much larger scale. So. Yeah, I mean, we definitely, I mean, we worry about storage and compute. Um, at our scale, we actually ha um, have, you know, reasonably good rates for this, but it's 2.1 billion files and we're, just getting ready to bring in the last of the Trump records because it took quite a while. Um, we got a later start on those than we expected. And so we're still working on them. And that number is gonna jump in a huge way. And I mean, I'm thinking about when we did the Obama ingest, we brought in 600 million emails, just emails. Wow. So we, you know, there's no way that we could ever do anything more than a 10% sample and, you know, be, you know, we also worry about being, you know, green, you know, how much are we going to just use so much electricity and compute to do this if we feel comfortable with the risk level of doing 10% sampling? Right. Leslie, I just want to say I'm so encouraged to hear you talking about that because years ago, <clears throat> coming from a background where I supported accounting and financial systems, you know, and it was regular practice that you audited a percentage of the overall records. And that was considered, you know, good enough. And given that Amazon and the cloud services are doing theirs, it seems like that has supported us being able to take that option into account. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think before we had things like Amazon Cloud, people were more reluctant to even consider that. Yeah. This is encouraging. I mean, I mean the, the thing about, about us, Robin, is that we got our first transfers of records in 1970. So you know, we got tapes from mainframes in 1970. 
So we've had a very long time to think about, you know, sustainable and feasible practices for this, you know, whether you're talking about the cloud or not, because, you know, we have to consider staff and staffing and what's feasible for them, because we, we keep having to remind people there's still people involved in this. You know, we have preservation archivists, we have processing archivists, and I, none of us in good conscience could ask someone, you know, to say, hey, so do you mind overseeing nonstop fixity checking? You know, it's, it's not something that we could or should be asking staff to do. I think Nathan's hand went up first. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie. I'm sorry to have arrived late. And, and that's much to my detriment because I missed your cats and and the beginning of your talk. Um, so two quick things. Um, one is a comment, and then the the second is a question. Um, sort of riffing on what everybody else has said here, I, I've been mulling over this topic of um, of leveraging uh, what's available in modern systems, whether it be in the cloud or ZFS, sort of or I can't remember the abbreviation for the type of storage that's out there now, where you do get that kind of automatic block scanning mm -hmm. um, for integrity's sake. And it, it would be wonderful if, if big players could put more pressure on some of these providers to, to, to at least make that a bit more transparent um, for those of us that can't lean into that the same way. Um, because I totally agree that even on our really small scale, I mean, you know, we're, we're tiny compared to CDL or NARA or anyone on this call. Um, we've had to disable checksum um, checkers in some of our repositories because they just overwhelmed things yeah. um, for various reasons. So uh, I think that would be great. And it, it's certainly one of the big topics that I hope to hear more about in the coming year. Um, yeah, Amazon used to have a digital preservation meeting once a year, and it was a small invitational meeting. And one of the things that, you know, we would always harp on to them was the lack of openness of mm. the, the fixity checking. And this was a bit of a surprise to them because, you know, they were, yeah, Stephen was at some of those meetings. I see him, him popping up in the video. Um, it was a bit of a surprise to them, wasn't it, Stephen, that, you know, they thought that they were like taking this on and helping us. And we're like, no, this needs to be auditable. You're not understanding it. Yeah, so I think that would be, I think it'd be wonderful. And I just wanted to throw that out there as, as a comment. And, you know, I, I know I know more and more people who would be inclined if there's transparency to abide by this at various levels, if, if they could just engage with that somewhat. Um, my question for you real quickly is, um, you know, there's often discussion in, in these sort of circles about how do you get your, um, the agencies that you engage with or, the, the folks that are creating the records to 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 buy into a system. But I was curious in hearing your talk about these VMs, how, how has it been for your archivists, for your processors to transition to that cloud to cloud um, environment? Has that been just sort of secondhand um, or have there been kind of moments there that you've noticed as, as you've transitioned to even these, these sort of tests? Oh, we, we, we haven't put the cloud to cloud into full production yet we've done the but you know the archivists just want to have a good scalable place to work where they're not dependent on a local machine with limited memory and on our regular in-house network backbone because honestly the you know there's you know while there's limiters on the machines and their power there is a real limit to network capacity and that's one of the things that we always have to, you know, remind people is, is that, you know, we still have to get these into the cloud, which is why we've been working with Snowballs and Direct Connect and doing everything we can to not stress out, you know, Naranet, our regular network background that everybody uses. Yeah, that's, so, a great, that's a great point. I, if you don't mind, I'll quote you on that as I try to advocate <laughs> for something similar. No, I'm, I'm dead serious. No, it's a huge, it is a huge selling point. It is a, a, a huge selling point because every single one of us has felt some pain at, at some point over working on a local machine or in the network and having a scalable VM um, and network capacity to get things into the cloud. 
priceless. Thank you. Well, not priceless. It costs, but yeah. And Scott had his hand up. Hi, uh, thank you. That's really interesting. I especially uh, like the idea of not moving the files around and just working with them in the cloud and then applying metadata. We have quite a few number of large files or so we're working with that. And by far the toughest part is moving them around and then checking to make sure nothing is lost. Um, the one question I had was thinking about, you know, this sort of all or nothing approach or percentage approach, I guess, not nothing approach to checksums. I was wondering, is the, uh, are the things that you're archiving and preserving ranked at all or classified at all in terms of criticality? As I'm thinking, it's one thing if, you know, a minor maybe receipt or something loses this checksum and oh, that, you know, gets corrupted and that's a bummer. But are there items or documents where you really, really do not want that thing to become corrupt? And that one in particular, you might want to check more often? No, we don't privilege any of our collections. I mean, there's sort of like an internal mindset that the presidential collections are a little privileged. Um, but here's the thing. Um, the scope of NARA's collecting are the permanent records of the federal government. And that's something that agencies propose in their record schedules, and we review and approve. That comes to about 5% of what's created in the federal government in you know, the course of their normal work. So everything is important. Um, we've done things to sort of get around some of the scale issues and you know, issues about privileging by saying, you know, we used to have, I mean, you asked, you know, one thing, Nathan, about, you know, something that archivists had to get used to. We introduced this concept of capstone for email, you know, obviously now over a decade ago, where if you're an official of an agency of a certain level of importance, like the head of the agency, the deputy head of the agency, then we get all your email. It doesn't matter if one of those emails is a lunch order and the other one is approval of a treaty. We just get them all because we cannot possibly go one by one by one through all email for key people at an agency. It's the same under the Presidential Records Act, whereby every single file created by every single person for the entirety of a presidential administration is permanent. Um, Elizabeth and I often laugh, Elizabeth sees, I think, more of these than I do, at some of the things that we come across, because, you know, presidential administrations have interns. Um, we have a lot of saved video game files that have come in with those collections, and we treat them exactly the same as anything else, as um, Elizabeth's two favorites, Dot Potato, and um, what was it? How is it, Elizabeth? Dot hell yeah statistics 2022? 2000 unemployment stats, hell yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a file extension we have. So we, we don't privilege them. I mean, we do that to a certain extent with our physical collections, yes, um, in terms of condition and rarity. Uh, for certain things, but nope, we don't privilege anything. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question about the uh, fixity chicken. Uh, so your 10% sampling, how often do you do that? So do you have a schedule of once a year, once half a year? The, the current practice for sampling is once a year. We're that's absolutely open to discussion. Okay, thank you. Stephen. Hi, Leslie. Uh, I'm sorry if you've already covered this. I, I, I joined very, very late. But again, on the sampling question, is that 10%? Do you sample sort of equally across everything? Or do you is it ten percent of more granular categories so that you're you're assured that 
across keyword. everything. Across, okay. No, it's across everything because we don't we don't really categorize. I mean, it's, you know, the, the repository is 100% agnostic. We have several hundred different variants of file formats. And, you know, why would we, you know, also privilege any category? Um, we do, we, we want to sample across everything. Now the catch is, is that, yeah, sure. That means that some formats we're gonna get, a, you know, just by randomness, we're gonna get more email, more TIFFs, more JPEGs, more PDFs, more ASCII files, because those are the types of records that we have much higher percentages of. So it's something to be considered, sure. But I'm not sure programmatically how we would do that behind the scenes, so. Well, I mean, so you're not overly concerned that, for example, you're not maybe, you know, this this sample cycle, you're you're going to miss some audio. You're not going to get any audio, or or maybe more importantly, you're not going to get any you know frame maker things, <laughs> or um, or again, you're not you're not going to get something from a presidential collection this time around. But you're going to you know for whatever randomly, you're going to get a lot of stuff from you know the uh, you know the the janitorial records from <laughs> GSA or something like that. I, I, I but. Because this 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 is a question. See, now I actually to, have now I actually have to go and check to see if we have any janitorial records. Well, I, who knows? But you know, uh, this is a question that we're wrestling with. You know, for for all the same reasons you say. I mean, because we used to just, you know, do the paint the bridge. You know, as soon as you cycle through everything, you start all over again, and that um, we were obviously much more um, concerned about the you know the longer term environmental impact of that. So we're we're thinking about ways to be smarter. Yeah, Robin. Yeah, so uh, another question about this ten percent. Do you track the ten percent that you check so that the next year when you do a different ten percent, you're not hitting the same records? I would actually have to check with engineering how samples are generated. I'm not aware that we would be doing that Thanks. yeah because we don't i know we also don't do it for physical we still have some tapes that we sample and i know we don't exclude something from a sample if it was in the previous year because we want it to be truly random and to be truly random you can't leave something out of the hole Okay, let's see. I have a um, uh, just a, a more general question about your use of lambda functions. Um, it sounds like you all use lambda functions pretty heavily, and um, I'm yeah, I'm curious if you could comment on where you see those functions being more advantageous in terms of like specific operate or just operations um, in the cloud. <sighs> um, well, I mean, we do a lot of parsing. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a big part of what we use them for is parsing and it, parsing, parsing and indexing. So we make a lot of use of Lambda functions there because we, um, um, we use Elasticsearch, we use Tika, you know, that means that we can call the um, format characterization, the MIME type work. So we, a lot of that is for sort of the underlying technical assessment work in terms of the Lambda functions. Okay. okay. All right, I mean, I've always heard that Lambda functions are best used for small operations that take place where you have lots and lots of these small operations. Um, and I, you know, I wonder at, you know, the scale that you all are working, does that become impractical in some ways or has it actually scaled really well? Um, just, I guess, with regard, regard to cost. So far, it's scaled. I mean, because we, you know, when, when you think about the, you know, where we're heavily using the Lambda functions is at the point of ingest. Mm -hmm. And they're being run on discrete accessions and sets of transfers. So it's not like we're necessarily running a Lambda function on 2.1 billion files at a time. We're running on 100, 1,000, 10,000. 
you know, when they're coming in. So that's, you know, we haven't had a problem with that. Right, right. That makes sense. Okay. Great. Steven? Thanks. I'm Steven. Sorry to monopolize. Um, uh, so Robin, you, uh, Robin, Leslie, uh, my last meeting. Um, so you're doing all this in GovCloud, um, which I don't know a lot about, maybe you know more, but is it your understanding that apart from this, the increased security levels, you know, could we do everything you're doing in the cloud cloud that you're doing in GovCloud? And should we have the same level of confidence in, in the non-Gov cloud that you have in GovCloud? It's an interesting question. So because you missed part of the presentation. So one of the things about us and GovCloud um, and the fact that we are a records holding organization, it means that we can't use a lot of the hosted Amazon services in the way that you could, because we can't pass those files around. So our stuff is actually, you know, in its own secure enclave, which meant while we use their stacks, we have stick build versions of our own in our own enclave. So it would probably be easier for you because you could take advantage of them. Um, but it depends on, you know, I haven't modeled the costs about, you know, us doing it in our own enclave versus taking, you know, advantage of what's already hosted and passing things back and forth. So I'm required for security purposes to keep it all in our enclave. So ours is not necessarily the same model as everybody else's. But it was not hard for us to do this in GovCloud at all. Let's see, I think Michelle has, uh, I think we have time for one last question here. Uh, Michelle wrote in the chat, along the lines of quote unquote, don't trust Amazon or reflect that all storage in this system seems to be provisioned through Amazon. This could become a single point of failure due to the lack of commercial diversity. Although, you know, hard to contemplate now, I know, but um, then she says, do you have thoughts about if how this should be addressed? You're not wrong. I mean, this is something that we, I'm not going to say struggle with, but I'll say that we think about this, um, not just because in federal contracting, all federal contracts need to be recompeted every five years. Um, so we are, you know, we're very bound with Amazon right now, although we recompete with, you can, we can't contract directly with Amazon, we contract with Amazon resellers. And we have changed reseller um, and service provider at least once. Um, you know, I worry about it. I mean, because we, we've, we've all for decades talked about having, you know, different architectures and different types of storage and different locations. And even though I've got, you know, great and improving, you know, diversity of storage locations and replication, I'm still only in Amazon. Um, so we are looking to add another provider that's on our budget for our next fiscal year. Um, we won't necessarily reprovision an entire system in another provider, but we would certainly store the records in another provider. But that's all a little bit TBD. We haven't started on those contracts yet. Yes. Okay. All right. Here's cat number two. They came to us named applesauce and sour cream, like toppings for latkes. But uh, yeah. Hi. Okay. Where are you going? You're going this way, aren't you? There you go. So yes, your recording of me will have two kittens and a conversation with my husband about taking our old cranky cat to the vet. I think it'll be all right. We'll, we'll post it on YouTube, but I think it'll be fine. So can I just ask a good time for one more? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think um, the with I'll just quickly mention um, with regard to the uh, 
uh, charter that I, I had talked about earlier that we were going to have on our agenda. We will pick that back up in our next meeting, but I would also just want to encourage folks to take a look at that document. If you have any comments um, or thoughts, be welcome to put them there. But um, yeah, John, go for it. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you, Leslie, you mentioned uh, stick belt. I hadn't heard that. I guess that's custom. It is custom. We have, so, we have built our own versions in our own enclave. Hi, oh, off the keyboard. Okay, a little cat right. butt action. And so it's interesting to have this um, kind of really complicated, um, someone wrote, uh, Michelle, complicated landscape of contracting. Uh, and then the renewed contracting and the sort of indirect going through there, plus your custom built stuff. It's it's almost like the the bureaucratical the bureaucratic overhead just in that alone must be pretty time consuming. Um, it 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 is. Um, I mean, we have a good development team that's a mix of federal staff and contractors, um, and same for support of the environments. It's also a mix of federal staff and contractors. So there's always continuity. So even in the recompeting, we always have continuity with federal staff in systems engineering and um, system operations. So I, I don't feel that if we were to suddenly have a radically different contract, that we would lose you know, control of our environment and how we do things. And um, we have a lot of documentation. We're a federal agency. We have a ton of documentation. We have a ton of excellent in-house IT security folks. We have, um, we do annual COOP continuity of operations exercises that include restoration, not of the whole thing, but we do do restoration tests, you know, from environments. So we feel I feel as prepared as I can be. If I were as risk averse as, you know, some of my IT security colleagues, we wouldn't even have a repository because you don't want to touch things. I have to accept risk and signed risk acceptance letters um, sure. that say that we're, yeah. you know, that this is an acceptable level of risk and that I'm comfortable operating this way across these environments. That's very impressive. I'm so very impressive that, that you get all that done and keep it running. Yeah, we keep it running. I will say that our rate of new development is not what I wish it would be because there is an overhead to operations and security. But, you know, we just keep moving forward and we keep bringing things in. And, you know, 24 seven, we are processing and loading records. So we feel pretty proud of ourselves and pretty happy with where we are. Thank you. All right. Well, we are at the hour. Um, thank you, Leslie, for a great talk and for staying for the entire hour. Um, it was wonderful. We will go ahead. We have recorded everything, so we will post this up on YouTube in the next week or two, um, cats and all. And uh, I just wanted to uh, um, check with my co-chair, Robin. Is there anything else you wanted to mention before we wrap up? I don't think so, other than just thank you so much for coming. Oh, I'm happy to, Robin. I was I was happy happy to get the invitation. Interesting discussion. Lots of things to think about. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.